Tēnā koutou katoa. Tēnā koe George, te ahurangia o te Whariwānanga North Carolina ki Chapel Hill. I ngā kaiako o Waitaha, koutou ko ngā akoranga, ko ngā hoa mahi i te Whariwānanga o Waitaha. Tēnā koutou katoa. No mai, haere mai, tauti mai ki tēnei hui. He kaupapa whakahirahira mō tātou katoa. Nō reira, kei te mihi, kei te mihi, kei te mihi. So welcome everyone to this prestige lecture by distinguished Professor George Noblet on inverting culturally sustaining pedagogy, lessons about power, dominance and culture. I'm Jane Abbas and it is my privilege to act as George's host in the University of Canterbury School of Teacher Education and it is also my very great pleasure to be able to welcome you to this event. Uh, George joins us from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill as a visiting Canterbury Fellow in the School of Teacher Education. He is a leading scholar in sociology of education and has published widely in relation to issues of social justice, equity, race and class in education, as well as critical and post-critical educational ethnography. George has edited multiple volumes, including most recently two Springer publications in the form of the Second International Handbook of Urban Education, which I think is in press, George, unless it's already out, um, and a collection titled Education, Equity and Economy, Crafting a New Intersection. He is also editor-in-chief of the Oxford Research Encyclopedia of Education, which seeks to be the authoritative resource for those who wish to understand the complex field of educational inquiry and endeavour. George is leading this exciting initiative. We are excited to have George with us here in the College of Education and to have an opportunity to engage with him about questions of equity in education and culturally sustaining pedagogy as these play out in US and Aotearoa New Zealand context. Equity issues are of concern and interest to us all as we try to do the right thing by children and young people in schools, students in tertiary education, colleagues in our workplaces, and Aotearoa New Zealand society more generally. It is then my very, very great pleasure on behalf of the College of Education, School of Teacher Education and the Teacher Learning and Innovations Research Hub to welcome you, students, teachers, colleagues and members of the public, to this prestige lecture. George will speak for approximately 50 minutes. He's given me permission to give him the sign. Um, and then we will open things up for questions and discussion. And I know that George really does welcome comment and discussion from the floor. His phrase was, I hope people will, will have at me. So please don't, don't be shy to um, share thoughts, ask questions and open up the discussion when that opportunity arises. So George, welcome. We're delighted to have this opportunity to hear from you and to engage with you about challenges in both understanding and walking the talk of culturally sustaining pedagogy. And the microphone is yours. This is where my inabilities uh, will shine. There we go. Thanks, Scott. Thank you, Jane, for that all too kind introduction. Truth be told, I'm someone who lives daily with what I've not done. Uh, that's true on a whole bunch of fronts, as my family can tell you. Um, in the race and education patch that I have taken as my calling, there's so much to be done, so little time, so few whites who are willing to listen, and fewer whites yet who are willing to put themselves on the line. You will have noticed my naming of whites in this. Uh, this is fully purposive. I'm from the U.S., and the race patch there includes whites, of course, African Americans, Latinos, Native Americans, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, and many others. Um, this list is in order of my experience with groups, not in the demographic order, uh, which is shifting, as we know, every day. Um, uh, I will not try to elaborate the differences between these groups today. Um, we can talk more about that later. I'm going to 
w stay with African Americans, or blacks as some prefer the, as a name, um, because I have the most experience working with black teachers and in what people call black schools. Um, I'll emphasize now and later that I am white, and I speak mostly about what, it can, be what can be learned from inverting what blacks have had to say to whites. Being white is centralist talk for many other reasons. First, it signals racialized dominance. I'm a member of a group that created racism with all its horrifying consequences in my society. Second, whites control all the social institutions of my society, including the schools. The schools were designed to work for whites, and they do exceedingly well. Third, the majority of teachers in the US are white and female. And as of 2014, the majority of our students are of color. Uh, this imbalance will get much more imbalanced with time. Uh, and it's important, I think, to remember that school desegregation, which was to be a solution to racial inequity in our society, um, was accompanied by school districts firing black teachers in huge numbers, destroying both the black teaching force and the black middle class. Current teachers of color find the whiteness of schools soul-destroying. Few survive it. Racism is the American problem. It is due to whites, including me, that it continues to exist. Now, we all know the U.S. is not New Zealand. I will continue the practice I've used in classes and in other lectures here of arguing the best I can offer is a chance for you to draw an analogy between the U.S. and New Zealand, to see where it is apt and where it fails as an analogy. Um, I will not try to draw the analogy in my talk because I'm too ignorant of New Zealand to do that. Uh, but I'd be glad to explore the analogy with you during question session that will follow. My talk has a few twists, so let me start with some, something of where I, where I will end while keeping a few secrets just to maintain drama. Um, this talk is to worry notions of culturally responsive, relevant, and or sustaining pedagogies, and to er invert them in a way to reveal some disturbing realizations. I put realizations in quotes here. Um, this term, is, realization, is cho also chosen for reasons. What I offer are are both what I have come to realize, that is, that I, as a white man, see as real. I'm not claiming these realizations uh, to be the same realizations that black educators may have, even the ones I'm relying on, whose work I'm relying on today. I hesitate these claim, to claim these realizations to be truths, uh, because speaking across racial difference is far too complex for anything like that to be possible. Uh, indeed, that's one basis of my argument today. It is clear that we must make att attempts to speak across groups and cultures, but let's have no doubt that such attempts are problematic. Differences in power across racialized groups in the U.S. make this especially difficult, even dangerous. In white dominance, superiority, and racism that has driven scholars and teachers of color in the U.S. to articulate, it, I'm sorry, it is white dominance, superiority, and racism that has driven scholars and teachers of colors in the U.S to articulate ideas about how students of color can be best served in the schools. These ideas, of course, are not static, uh, because both change is ubiquitous, and also because they are struggling to figure out how best to explain it to me, the white man, the white teacher. They're trying to figure out, how can I hear what needs to be done? And I am, as a white person, implicated in keeping white dominance in place. These black scholars have to work hard to keep up with my power. Whiteness is shape-shifting a form of dominance. These black scholars are trying to get ideas accepted in education's white-controlled discourses. They have to get past reviewers, publishers, fellow scholars, and fellow teachers who all have a say about these approaches. And finally, there's the white public with its control over schools and over what ideas count. There's a lot more going on here, but let me stop with this framing for now. Let's go on to pedagogy for a moment so we can orient ourselves a bit differently. Um, first, uh, let me distinguish between three types of pedagogies that are seen, that seem to be about teaching black students. Again, I'm sticking to African Americans. I don't want to try to do, that's a bad enough generalization, I, I don't want to make it any worse than it is. Culturally responsive pedagogy, culturally relevant pedagogy, and culturally sustaining pedagogy. Again, please remember that I'm speaking from the U.S. I've learned in New Zealand similar ideas have been taken up somewhat differently, uh, but that's a limit of my knowledge. I'm not going to go there any, anymore. <clears throat> there are more pedagogies of this, of this sort, uh, reality pedagogy, culturally revitalizing, pe revitalizing pedagogies for, are good examples. But these three are sufficient for my purposes today. 
I should also note that these are in response to earlier pedagogical approaches that were created by white folks. And I have to admit that I was part of creating that discourse at the time of school desegregation. It was a black teacher who revealed how blinded I had been by whiteness, um, but that's another story. Given, uh, given the time today, let's do an all too reductionistic uh, comparison. It violates sophistication of thought, each author evidences, but it will do for my purposes. Uh, culturally Responsive Pedagogy by Geneva Gay. Teachers need to be developing a knowledge base about cultural diversity, including ethnic and cultural diversity content in the curriculum, demonstrating caring and building learning communities, communicating with ethnically diverse students, and responding to ethnic diversity in the delivery of instruction. Geneva Gay wrote, Using cultural characteristics, experiences, and perspectives of ethnically diverse students as conduits for teaching them more effectively. It is based on the assumption that when academic knowledge and skills are situated within the lived experiences and frames of references of students, they are more personally meaningful, have higher interest to appeal, and are learned more easily and thoroughly. Culturally relevant pedagogy, Gloria Ladson Billing. Uh, this, the pedagogy includes teachers working on one, academic success, defined as intellectual growth, not the all too narrow tested notions of academic achievement, but intellectual growth. Cultural competence, to, uh, to, for the students to be able to appreciate and celebrate their own culture, and to learn and become fluent in another. And socio-political consciousness, to use knowledge beyond the classroom, to identify, analyze, and solve real world problems. Gloria wrote, I suggested that culturally relevant teaching is distinguished by three broad propositions regarding self and other, social relations, and knowledge. She had wrote an article in 2014 that has a subtitle, Remix, uh, in which she notes that culturally re relevant pedagogy was built on students as subjects, not objects. And she also noted that few have taken up the sociopolitical consciousness that she called for. Um, in the same remix article, she claimed that culturally sustaining pedagogy is the next step. Uh, culturally sustaining pedagogy, Django Paris, is about not just honoring but recognizing our knowledge, skills, and ways of being are needed for success. The ways youth enact culture, language, and race are always evolving. It involves critiquing aspects of our culture. Extends previous visions of asset pedagogies. Um, are you folks familiar with funds of knowledge and those kind of things? So those kinds of pedagogies. Uh, note I've bolded our here. You know, it's a shift in these three from uh, who's speaking and how it's being located. Um, Django Paris wrote that, that culturally sustaining pedagogy requires that our pedagogies become more, more than responsive or relevant to the cultural experiences and practices of young people. It requires that they support young people in sustaining the cultural linguistic competence of their communities while simultaneously offering access to dominant cultural competence. It has as its explicit goal supporting multilingualism, multiculturalism in practice, and perspective for teachers and students. Um, uh, uh, Paris in another article suggests that it has, it has two most important tenets, the plural and involving nature of youth identity and cultural practices, and two, a commitment to embracing youth culture's counter-hegemonic potential, while maintaining a clear-eyed critique of the ways in which youth culture can also reproduce sy systematic inequalities. One good example from the U.S. is the, the embracing of hip-hop pedagogy that also includes a critique of gangster rap. Right, so yes and, right, rather than no because. Um, so culturally sustaining pedagogy seeks to perpetuate and foster linguistic, literate, and cultural pluralism as part of the democratic project of schooling and needs and as a needed response to demographic and social change. It, dem it democratizes schooling by supporting both tr traditional and evolving ways of cultural connectedness for a contemporary youth. So we can see a progression here, and I'm just going to go to the third one. You can, I think you can see from having culture, having culture employed in such things as sociocultural or uh, sociopolitical project to culturally sustaining, where, uh, where it's much more outwardly directed to the cultural and linguistic competent of the communities and, and to create a pluralistic society. I assume most of you are familiar with pedagogical projects, pedagogical projects like this or others that have a family resemblance, let's say, to them. In the U.S., the hum there are huge literatures that have been built up around them, and 
huge amount of uh, professional development for teachers that has been undertaken on them. Uh, moreover, from the blogosphere, it is evident that today teachers are taking up these mantles and moving on with them. Um, I love the teacher blogosphere. It tells me that the teachers are doing all kinds of stuff we don't even remember they're doing. Um, so Dominica Washington is a teacher in Chicago. Um, in this call, so she has her blog. This is a column she wrote on talking about the mama effect. Uh, black women have moral authority that whites do not and cannot have. Um, uh, so I, all these pedagogies are all to the good. I'm not here to critique them in that sense. They ask a lot of teachers, and thankfully teachers like Dominica and others are stepping up. Um, but I want to look at them differently today. I propose to you that these are examples at attempts at cross-cultural communication. Geneva Gay was saying white teachers have to understand that there are other perspectives, and you have to respect them and invite them other perspectives and invite those other perspectives into the classroom. Gloria Ladson Billings was saying that there is even more needed. White teachers need to be cultural brokers and take on the politics of race. Django Paris was saying that white teachers must recognize that black culture is fully capable of creating successful black students and that white teachers need to act to sustain that culture. Further, white teachers must take on larger goals, creating a democratic pluralistic society, for one. Um, these black educators ha have to speak to white teachers because the de demographic reality I, noticed, I noted before. Uh, white teachers will be teaching black and other students of color for the foreseeable future. Black educators have to try to educate whites like me as to what to be, do to be effective. Their children's futures rely on them being successful at this. These pedagogies are deadly serious, and they're designed and written for white teachers. Each pedagogy builds on the other, pushes the envelope a bit further, but all are framed as instances of cross-cultural communication. Each has a devastating message for whites as well. Each is saying to whites that we are lacking. We have deficits we do not recognize. Um, but they're also trying to do, do this in, let's say, an empowering way, so as not to alienate people like me. Uh, and so that people like me will continue to try to do things that are in the interests of their children. Personally, I hope this, is, this will be successful. The U.S. really needs it to be successful. Um, each black educator that we've talked about so far attempts to phrase the pedagogy uh, differently, but each I posit pulls up short because they need white teachers to take these pedagogies on. They pull up short in telling white teachers what is really going on for many reasons. Let me enumerate three. Uh, one reason is the classic problem of communicating something that is implicit. Culture is implicit and involves taken for granted meanings and ways of doing things. Because whites have so little direct experience with the everyday lives of black, uh, black Americans, we never get to get close to black culture. Black educators have to make their culture explicit to attempt to communicate with whites. But let's be clear. A culture is not what can be said about it to someone who is not from that culture. This means that the attempt at cross-cultural communication is, at a minimum, compromised. Second, black educators also have to use communication mechanisms created by white culture, research being one of them, right? This academic research game we're in. Reason, you, ever, you know that term used to be in the liberal arts? I never could figure out what they meant by that, but I still got a college degree. Um, it, but these research and reason as basis for legitimate claims, uh, white argumentation styles, the written word, not the spoken word, for example, which is so powerful in the black community, um, and so on. If the medium is the message, as Marshall McLuhan famously argued all those years ago, then whites get a whitewashed understanding of black culture as a result. I want to be clear here. These authors really have no option in this. They have to use the media that whites recognize and value to get their message across. The whitewashing is a product of white culture and its enforcement of superiority. Finally, the third point, returning to an er the earlier point, black educators have, much to deal with, ha have had much to deal with um, given the white domination over the U.S. James C. Scott, in the book Domination in the Arts of Resistance, argues there are at least two transcripts of social commentary. One is the public transcript of the dominant group that characterizes the social world in ways that justifies their dominance. The other is the hidden transcript of the oppressed, which ep 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 ugh, here we go, explicates the social world they experience, um, names the injustices done every day to the oppressed, and identifies the consequences of those injustices. 
The hidden transcript cannot be spoken in public, to the dominant group anyway, without the result of being massive increase in repression. If it is spoken, then the person who spoke must be shunned. I was watching the news the other night, shamed and, uh, shamed and blamed. Music, right? Shunned, excommunicated, taken down, denigrated, imprisoned, defined as mentally ill and or killed. Black educators are, facing, are faced with the dilemma of having to speak while trying to get their children served better. But the risk is that speaking directly will lead to a discounting of their perspective. Expulsion from teaching, I've seen black teachers fired for speaking out against disproportionate discipline procedures. Um, and, or and or an incitement of a race war. For those of you who've watched our last, uh, the Obama administration, <laughs> Obama, who I will characterize as a racial moderate, was accused of prompting in the U.S. as a whole a, a race war, a massive over overreaction meant to shore up white supremacy. Relatively successful? Look who we have present for now. Um, if the oppressed speak their perspective, then they will pay. And is, as importantly, any future exposition of it will be squelched. Pulling up short of this by these authors then is strategic. It enables a level of communication while we're doing, reducing risk. Related to these pedagogies and related to this kind of argument, Rich Milner, um, one of our leading scholars of urban education in the U.S. asked, why is culture the ad adjective being used in these pedagogies when race, racism, and white supremacy are the issues? Culture is a term acceptable to whites. After all, it's created by whites like me to characterize the world of primitives. The anthropologists were, thought they were studying. Right? Thankfully, black educators are willing to keep up trying. They're willing, even under these conditions, to speak. Um, one good example is Chris Emden in his new book. You can read the title, For White Teachers Who Would Teach in the Hood, and for the rest of y'all, too. The Washington Post reporter Emma Brown wrote, and I quote, Christopher Emden said he wasn't trying to alienate anyone with the title of the book. Okay, so we know it alienated some people, right? Um, for white folks, she gives the title. But he did want to start a conversation that he knew wouldn't be entirely comfortable. A conversation about the failures of well-meaning teachers whose approach to education, in Emden's view, often does more harm than good for their black and Latino students. And Emden argued in an interview, I'm not against white teachers. I'm not against white people. In fact, I'd make the argument that if I don't have white teachers teaching in the hood, we're screwed. Who's going to teach? But I need those teachers to feel some tension, some discomfort. So these black educators who are designing pedagogies for whites are intelligent, brave people. Even if communication with people like me is fraught with issues of miscommunication, they're working hard to educate people like me and to keep us sympathetic to their cause and to the extent possible, join them and working for black students in schools. But there is something not being said. Something that is, there is good evidence to justify. Something people of color, like Dominica Washington, who you saw her photo earlier, are clear about. I think it is time to invert the message that white teachers can be effective in teaching black students. My inversion today is a form of transposition shifting the position of our gaze. Rather than ask what these authors are saying, my inversion is to ask, what are these authors not saying because they can't afford to alienate white teachers? Let's think about shifting from what is said to what is not said, shifting from what could make white teachers effective to what do black teachers have that we will never able to, be, to replicate because we are white. Um, the black educators we've been speaking of today have been trying to speak to white educators, but their attempts are compromised. Um, um, I, I want to say a number of things about this. I want to say what is against us being possible for people like me to be effective. To whites, this is going to appear pessimistic. Right? In the U.S., I've done talks like this before. I know the response that is likely to happen. And to some sense, I'm going to agree. It is a pessimistic read. Um, they say, we cannot do what black teachers can. I hope they lead to an opening up of a clear-eyed dialogue. But my experience with white teachers in the US is that pessimism is not rewarded. They see it as defeatist and undermining of their capabilities. There's also a status issue here that I fully get. Right? I don't want to downplay that at all. I must acknowledge that I see this <clears throat> view as a key tenet of white supremacy the belief that institu institutions will and should work for you, that is in your power to fix things 
Whites do not like the idea that struggle is perpetual and accomplishment fleeting. Um, I would argue that humility and pessimism are good places to start a new agenda for teaching students of color better, <clears throat> if not well. So what is not being said? Black teachers can teach black kids better than white teachers. Um, research is actually pretty much inconsistent with them. So there's effects on achievement, uh, on expectations, and most recently high school completion rates and, high, and higher university aspirations, right? And you'll see the kind of review, if you read through there, what the research is showing consistently about having a black, one black teacher in a black kid's experience. Um, and as journalists have noted, they now, this is, so this is a website that journalists go to to, to download their, their stuff for their stories. Right? So this is what's cut into the thing. As the United States becomes more racially and ethnically diverse, education leaders are pushing for greater diversity among school, pu public school teachers. A growing body of research suggests children benefit in many ways from having a teacher of the same race or ethnicity. Published studies, for example, suggest that black students do better in reading and math and are less likely to be suspended from school when they have black teachers. So the journalists have this. So it's now out in the public media. Um, so this leads me to ask, whoop, where am I going? There we go. What is it that they have that I do not? Before we get to my realizations, let's start by remembering that black teachers have all the formal knowledge and capabilities that go with being professional teachers. They have, met, they have the same credentials. They've been prepared to and have met the same standards, in part due to professional accreditation uh, processes. They have passed the same qualifying tests. We should also remember that they have full knowledge of curricula, pedagogical content knowledge, one of our terms, professional teaching skills, school structures and processes, et cetera, as do any other teachers. And then they have, by my count, at least 25 attributes that I and other white educators are hard pressed to claim. I've organized these into four things. I'm not sure about these clumps, right? And these aren't mutually exclusive, right? These are my attempts to list out. So they have, black teachers have a set of involvements. They have social involvement in the community being served, churches, barbershops, right, that we don't. And thus relationships with community members and parents that go beyond the teaching role that enable the teacher to have a repertoire of relational possibilities to draw upon. The black community calls this fictive kinship, right? I, I don't find it in white communities, right? But it's an interesting concept. A direct involvement in the minoritized group's networks for nomination, support, uh, sponsorship, and support for learning, school success, higher education, and economic survival and success. And they have established relationship with white allies. They also have a set of knowledges. I apologize for the small print. They have so many knowledges, right? I, I wanted to keep it on one slide so we kind of keep this image. There's a lot going on here. Um, they have direct knowledge of the community's already existing funds of knowledge. They have direct experiential knowledge of the racialized history in general and within this community. They have knowledge of the community's wider historical and contemporary experience. That's just beyond the racial experience within the context of the wider society and how youth are implicated in it. I should have broke those into two. Anyway, knowledge of the hidden transcript, that which cannot be spoken without reprisals of the dominant group because it jeopardizes the supposed legitimacy of the dominant group. Nine, experiential and academic knowledge of what it takes for minoritized groups to survive in domination. Ten, knowledge of, ability to use and deploy current cultural tropes and practices. One that's running around the black community now is don't be a statistic understanding that the, the demographic characteristics we assign and prison rates and all those kinds of things. So there's a trope, right, that th they will use to talk to each other when the, the teacher will say to a kid, don't be a statistic, right? They can do that. I am, it has a whole different load when I do that. Um, direct knowledge of minoritized pop, youth pop culture, hip hop, for example. Knowledge of white allies and their history of alliances with other communities. Knowledge of strategies to work with the white community and other racial groups. There's also a set of capabilities. The capability to create culturally appropriate caring relationships in students uh, in classrooms. Um, our leadership status and capability in the community and school. Black teachers are often key leaders. Ability to express disaffection, the explanation of racism, and use it as a motivation for change. The capacity to appreciate 
and appropriately express appreciation for cultural forms of expression. I have a great example of a colleague of mine. We were sitting in, in her office, an African-American colleague of mine. A young black man was walking down the street. And so you get the image of strutting. There's a stereotypic thing we're doing here, right? And we were looking out, and she said, what do you see there? And I said, I see a young man strutting. And she says, no, I see a young man in his prime, right? She saw something more than I was able to see. Ability to recognize cultural expression as appropriate and not a discipline problem. Ability to counsel youth on when, where, and how to display their culture. Ability to use dialect appropriately and in a fully communicative form. Ability to critique curricula so that students can develop communicative competence with white man's knowledge. A while back I did a, a, a piece on what's said about the civil rights movement in, the, in social studies textbooks. It's really a, a really interesting thing. So, okay, black people are in there, and the civil rights movement is in there. There is no message of why it had to be. Whites were out of the picture, right? It would take a teacher to explain the curriculum is missing this, right, and how that's absolutely essential to why blacks were acting to, uh, against whites. And finally, a set of four commitments. A full commitment to racial improvement with full knowledge of its trade-offs in this community. A full commitment to provide leadership in the community. A full commitment to creating the next generation of their community and secondarily of the wider group and of the nation. Finally, a full commitment to teach white children to live in and play a role in a racially pluralistic society. 25 attributes that they have that we don't have, in my argument. So I'm coming to an end here. There are likely many more attributes that white teachers in the US are not likely to ever be able to share with black teachers, and which will limit their effectiveness in teaching black children. I noted above that this will be read as pessimistic, but I personally think of it rather as a challenge. The research on black youth racial identity indicates for black youth, racism has to be acknowledged, then used as a motivator for their identity to become positive rather than negative. I think white teacher racial, racial identity could be seen similarly. For white teachers to have a positive teacher racial identity, they must accept that they are la what they are lacking in multiple ways and must use this as a motivator to transform themselves. Where would you like to start? Thank you. Please do. I'd like to open up for questions, comments, discussions, and just opening a, a conversation. Um, so we've got the mic here. Yeah. 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 Y
they're, you know, they'll open up uh, uh, Afrocentric music schools and stuff like that, right? But they're still in education, but they're not in the public schools. So. Um, okay, so I have some experience working with First Nations. I'm certainly not the expert on this. Um, I would say two things. One, tribes are organizing, and I think that's a really good sign. We have a small but growing bank of Native American education scholars, which has become really essential to link education writ large with the tribes. Without them in place, this isn't going to happen well. Right. But we, um, we have a number of Native American scholars that are doing that. We also have uh, some Native American scholars that have worked with me are actually going back to the tribes and taking over cultural and educational programming for the tribes. So there's, there's an intersection happening there. Um, the truth of the matter is that the education systems do not serve them well. Their statistics are among the worst in our nation. Uh, so it's a small percent. I'm trying to two for it. 2.4 percent, something like that, but this is, they have the worst schooling outcomes of almost any group. So, very sad story. Yes, is that is that all? Do you, you have a follow up? Okay, great. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, that I think um, is quite productive in doing some of the things that you're talking about. Right. But I don't see that much evidence of that in sex education programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's no, it's it's, you know, uh, I would say we've written more about it than we've done, <laughs> right? Right. They're far more palatable to engage in because of all the reasons that you talked about earlier than the whole notion of problematizing whiteness. So I've experimented a bit with problematizing whiteness in the BA course, the stage three BA course that was the same in the nutrition I teach in. And they would have much rather talked about culturally responsive pedagogy because when you start problematizing <laughs> whiteness, a whole lot of shit comes up. Right? Mm -hmm. And, and by the way, as whites, we're not really very good at being able to get the, get to the next level, right? So we've got our own unpacking to go and do. But please go ahead. Yeah. Well, so it's far more threatening as a proposition to her, and it's got really big pedagogical implications to, to sort of think about. I think that are very different. Mm -hmm. um, like I think that there's a whole lot of stuff around engaging with emotionality and discomfort and things that I think are profoundly educational, but often people don't feel. So it involves a whole like thing, and, and I'm just talking about one small possibility of working in that space. But I think there's a lot of interesting work happening in this area, and people kind of experimenting with the whole idea of problematizing normalcy, which I think is quite productive. Um, yeah, but I just wanted to. Yeah, I, I'm first of all, let me say I agree. This is the direction we need to go in. I also want to say this. Um, whatever, uh, whatever shift has been in my racism has come not from studying and not from reading. It's been from have, working for people. And the most powerful experiences are me working for a person of color who has control over me. Right? That has led to dramatic changes in how I understand my whiteness and my role. So I, I'm for, I think we have to engage whiteness, but I think there also has to be an engagement in, in a different power relationship 
with people of color for that to be fully effective. Teachers that, I, that I've worked with over the years, I try to make sure that they're in a non-same race classroom. Right? So a white teacher, I try to get in a black or Latino classroom, right? teacher's classroom and say, no, this is going to be really uncomfortable. And I'm not doing this to any black or Latino I, teacher. I've been, you know, we have a relationship. We're talking about it. The, you know, the, I have to assure them that this white person might be ready to make a shift, right? And then we'll make the placement. But, you know, that's, that's not going to change the demography of things very much, one at a time. Like that. But I think we really have to think about how do we put people in situations where they have to learn that their perspective is not the perspective that works. And that, that's harder to do because we don't control those spaces. We don't really have access to them. Mm. Or information to come and all the teachers that we mainly get in here come from those perspectives. Yeah, uh, many of you have probably seen or read uh, Other People's Children by Lisa Delpit, yeah. where, she, where she talks about the distinction between direct instruction and student centered instruction. And she goes, well, You know, that, that's a white culture problem. Black teachers don't make that distinction. Right? That, that makes no sense to a black teacher. She also talks about the distinction between authoritarian and authoritative teaching, saying white folks can only see the first. Blacks enact the second. Right? So yes, and it's, so it's deeply ingrained in our pedagogical knowledges. Right? Uh, we, there's a lot to try to unpack as we move through this. Um, and, and it's also to, to remember that, of course, the, you know, I've used the generalization black community here. Right? That's not one community. Right? It's, that, it's many communities. So in some sense, you, would, you really have to say, what communities are my, is my teacher ed program serving? Right? Where are my teachers going? How do I get those communities involved in this discussion? Right? Because they're going to have very particularistic views that the kids are going to need to know. Otherwise, they'll just make other mistakes of generalizing. Well, all blacks are like this. We'll do this. Or all Latinos are, you know, all Latino uh, males are macho. Right in the white's definition of macho, not the Latino definition of, of macho is taking responsibility. Right, so yeah, I'm with you. Other follow-up or more comments? Sure. Uh, that assumes I can actually manage the technology. Um, which ones do you want? <laughs> well, I'll go back to the beginning. As we talk, I'll kind of flip through them a bit. Okay. <laughs> Yes, Missy. Uh, thanks, Stuart, for uh, the talk and for helping us to rethink some of these knowledges and capabilities that black teachers might offer. Um, I am curious, though, about the generalization of all black teachers. I don't think you're saying that, but I think that's one of the dangers here. Hmm. Oh, of course. I and frankly, uh, the uh, you know I would say my point today was to provoke, not to propose a definitive statement, right? Um, but I think it's all too easy for us not to get hit in the face with the stuff. So I tried to do that here. So let me say a couple things. One is that. Um, I do not claim to know all about the black community or any black communities, right? What I will say is I also know that the same behaviors are interpreted differently, right? So what I would do and what a black teacher, when we do the same thing, it's interpreted differently. So yes, the behavior may be the same, but I don't think its meaning is the same. 
So I would be careful to tease that out in this research, right? So is the interpretation of this? Because the, the year I spent in a second grade classroom with a black teacher, my first definition of her was battle axe, right? right? And then I realized that every morning, as I'm sitting in the back of the room with my notepad, these kids she had taught the year before are coming through for reassurance, to talk to her, to get a hug, and going, what in the hell is going on here, right? Because she was a battle axe. She took no shit from no, not even the principal, right? I mean, she was, she was tough. Um, and I later learned how kids interpreted her, right? That is, they saw her as having moral authority and taking responsibility for them, right? And they would do anything for her, right? Because, so I think there's that that I, that I would say. Um, I, I think the other thing that I would say about um, um, how do we sort these things out, right, is that um, I think any, well, so, so let me go to the generalization problem. I think generalizations are always problematic. Um, I think we always have to do what we're doing here today is unpack them and try to, to get them close, get them fully uh, blossomed out, um, but I note that white science is built on them, right? So why is this a problem one way and we can't turn around and say to science that, whoa, wait a minute, your whole logic is to make this generalization, right? So if we're going to worry generalizations made about people, and I agree we should, then we also need to turn that lens back on how we, as academics, or as Christians, or whatever your, you know, whatever your denomination in this disciplinary world is, right? How we say generalized knowledge applies. How we value that over other forms. So I'll stop there. Took me a moment to get around that. I might have to rethink that too. Trish, I think it's Trish. I, my glasses won't go that far, and neither will my eyes, so. <laughs> I'm sorry, say it again. Oh, yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I, it is a real problem. By the way, pessimism is a white problem, right? So I think one way to answer that question, and this is just saying, do this. How does the black community survive its situation when they admit racism is never going away? If we can go and look at how black churches and black recreation leagues talk about being black in a white dominated society, in a society that's always going to be problematic for them, and still raise kids with positive racial identities that go somewhere, then they should be teaching us as whites, how do we take this on? Uh, in my own personal view, this whole notion of uh, accepting that all you get is struggle, you don't get accomplishment, that's a big step for white people like me. Right, to say, okay, I'm not going to get it. I'm not going to get there. All right? I'm going to have to perpetually engage in this process my whole life. And now as an old man, I, I can say, I'm going to die before I get anywhere near it. All 
right? I can hope I have some improvement over my life, but it ain't going away in my being, right? I, st I still have those deep records of racism that pop up when you go, oh, shit, I thought I got rid of that one, right? And, mm, so I still got it. So I have to say, it's, you have to embrace the struggle. You have to say it's going to go on forever. And I think that's a, that's a, that's a hard lesson for young people sometimes. But African-American communities, Latino communities, a lot of oppressed communities teach their kids that every day. And the kids go on and leave, live lives that are emotionally healthy. Right? Maybe not economically successful. That's the problem what we're dealing with in general. But they can be emotionally healthy. Yeah, and, and, and you, so I can't speak for New Zealand, but in the U.S., that's a term used to diss you out of the conversation with teachers. They see it as a pessimistic message. And, you know, gosh knows I've done some of this professional development and been basically walked out the door. Right? Thank you very much. Right? Don't ever come back here. Right? So, yes? Yeah, well, I, I, th I think if I might kind of play off your point. Uh, the, um, so back to Carol Malloy, who was this t teacher, this colleague of mine who we were talking about, the young black man strutting, right, what I saw and what she saw. Carol and I worked together for years. We had research grants together, wrote books together and everything. And, and Carol used to remind me at the end of the day, every so often, just to kind of you know, smack me upside the head. She'd go, well... You go home, you can leave this work behind. I can't. Right? You know, you, uh, right. I can go into a world that is not problematic for me, right? Because the world is organized for me. Carol couldn't, right? She was an, a leading math educator in the U.S., right? Just a big name. But she couldn't leave it home. Oh, that's clearly true. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I'm, I'm yeah. No, we can do the intersectionality. I would agree entirely. Yeah, I think that's really important in terms of what you're yeah. No, I, I agree with that entirely. But and and I do think you can, I do think you can go from gender discrimination out. Um, I don't think I want to go to analogizing. Right, that is, the, I've seen enough of leftist intellectuals in the U.S that want to take class or gender or something and overtake other forms of oppression by saying, oh, these are the, Michael Apple, who I've dissed before around here, who, who's a, I've worked together on many, on many projects. At one point, no, I've done this to it in his face, right? He, to deal with race, he says, okay, it's a, so this is, so because he wanted class to be the dominant category and he was trying to move away from that to acknowledge race, he ended up calling it a parallelist, non-synchronous phenomenon. And when Mike did that, I just went, oh, God, Mike, you know, just go home, right? How can you make that and not see what you're doing, right? So I'm, I, I think, I mean, clearly gender discrimination and, and the world is clearly gendered, yes. And we can work out from there. But I don't think you can, I don't want to do the analogies first. Maybe the analogies last, right? But I do think we can go there. Yes, well, remember that was race and women, right? Crenshaw, right, right. And it was in the law, and it has a lot to do with property.
right? So there's a lot of things going on there. I, I'm, I'm fully in favor of, of working the concept. I'm just, I just don't want us to do the, the you know, it's, it's, it's like, like I didn't do Latinos, I didn't do minorities in the talk, right? <clears throat> The Latino experience in the U.S. has a completely different history. Actually, has completely different histories, right? Um, and there, were, you know, oppression makes some parallels, but those are parallels that belong to oppression, not to the Latinos, right? So you have to be really careful in analogies. So, uh, thank you. More comments, complaints? No one's thrown anything yet. Jane promised me tomatoes <laughs> or tomatoes. <laughs> yes, thank you. It's, it is, it is, it, it's kind of everything that happens in schools in the U.S. are, are tied to race. And the U.S., you know, if anyone says, oh, this is going on in the U.S., you should say, oh, how is that racialized? It is such a basic kind of trope of American society that you can go into almost everything. Um, black teachers leave because white parents actually can't respect a black teacher teaching their kids, right? So if the kid says something, then the teacher must be wrong, right? Um, they leave because the curriculum is absolutely stupid, right? And they're powerless to change it. Because you remember that we test directly on the curriculum content. And you have to have five choices. And you have to pick the right one according to the curriculum. So if the black teacher goes, well, that is absolutely incorrect, her kid's test scores go down, right? So, you know, just, it's kind of where do you start in all? It's just kind of on, on all, kind of all fronts. The, and, you know, I got in all kinds of trouble. You, uh, this is talk is unique for you guys, but I got in all kinds of trouble declaring a while back that, black, that white controlled school districts can't effectively educate black kids. And, of course, that hit the media and the dean was waiting for me when I re returned. I'm looking at the tissue, right? you know, waiting for me when I returned. Yes, I get the point, but why do you do this in public, right? Um, but the truth of the matter is, the school districts are still trying to figure out how do they keep white people in them. They're not concerned with effectively educating black people. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, you know, it, it's really, you know, it's kind of the system is just off, right? Clunk. You know, what is it? Forty-five degrees, ninety degrees, hundred and eighty degrees from what? It need to be attending to to do anything effective. So, yes. Great.
Right. So, right. So, so. Um, oh, oh no, it's not celebrated at all. Um, you, if you can't get the social studies text to be straight, then you, you're dead meat. And, right. You also don't. We also don't teach anything about ethnomathematics. We, you know, we 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 do nothing on these on these things. But so let me let me. There's a similar argument. Emden actually does this very well. About um, there are. Uh, so this is Langston Hughes, I think. Um, house slaves and field slaves. House slaves served the master and took on the master's culture. Field slaves never learned the master's culture and were totally you know, abused. Right? And this analogy still exists in the black community. And Emden recently used it to distinguish some black teachers who are assimilated. Right? And that's the rest of y'all, too, in his book title, right? Now, I, my, the, the list I gave you, I don't think requires any cultural attributes. I think it requires you being a member of the community, right? And I tried to stay away from naming black cultural things. One, because I certainly should not be doing that. But two, that seems that makes it even worse. Like, how would you be able to, you know, know something in particular about a culture that's not yours? I tried to stay with. Okay, they're involved in certain ways. Their experience will give them direct knowledge of. There's a set of uh, knowledges that come from just being in the community. So I try. You know, so I'm, I'm. I know I didn't escape it. I know I'm making generalizations, but I do think that almost any African American would could arguably resonate with the list I gave you. And I, I, by the way, I will find out when I get home because my colleagues are waiting for me, right? And you know, if this ever appears in a video somewhere, I will, you know, they'll be in my office before I get there, right? Okay. All right, George, let's, let's sit down and talk about this, right? Um, so I get that. So my point there is that, yes, there are many different kinds of people in all groups. Um, I think the point was not so much about them as about us. I'm surprised none of you did the generalization about whites here. Y'all took that one, right? You're worried about my generalization about blacks. I just dissed all of, well, 85% of this room. And you get nobody went, oh, you're generalizing about me. Right. Hmm. What's that? Sorry, Sorry I'm getting. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Thanks for the talk. And um, uh, there were parts of it that were provocative, I think, uh, and there were parts that were discriminative. Mm -hmm. Oh, please. Uh, particularly about your generalizations. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and, and I'll start off by, um, by you know, how you, 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 just, you said that schools in the States are designed to work for whites. Uh, it, it actually used to be like that here. Mm -hmm. uh, yet, you know, way back in, you know, when the new settlers came, uh, it was a torrid time. Then came culturally responsive. Then yeah. Came Geneva gaze. Right. Uh, and I, I, I'm yet, yet to come to terms with, uh, with Paris, but I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in that. And thanks uh, for introducing it to, to some of us. It's, some people here might already know about it. Um, but uh, the, 
assumption I think that, that you can't do here is that all Maori teachers uh, are good teachers. Ah. Yes. All of those years ago, uh, when he was uh, only 94, actually, and so he was be, it was before that, but the education he mentioned came out in 1994, and he spent heaps and heaps of parts of chapters uh, on uh, teaching as an art. Right. Yeah. So, um, that, and that takes me next back to what is culturally responsive teaching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, that identify good teaching are actually quite universal. Uh, but the argument might be, but it's the way that the strategies are instantiated, mm -hmm. which then leads us towards this position. And I think you touched on that. Right. Yeah. So, um, uh, what do black teachers have that white teachers can learn from? Mm -hmm. Um, if, if I can respond to that, um, I actually, the, the thing I did about uh, accreditation and all that kind of stuff was actually just given that I think accreditation, um, uh, how should I say this, um, goes to the lowest possible standard, right, in the U.S., that uh, the argument was not the black teachers are better, it's that they're no worse than the rest of us, right? The, the you know, according to all formal standards, they're in the ballpark. Right, so the range is the same, I would imagine, as among whites. So that that would be my response. I wasn't trying to argue that they're superior. I'm just trying to say they're placed in a way that we can't be placed. I can't be placed. So I take, yeah, um, Eisner is a, one of my uh, favorites too. By the way, one of the things uh, Peter saw me do this earlier today. He he and I were out for lunch and we went by the library, and. So I, I play music, and I'm, I've studied arts education and stuff like that. The, the imagery that's wrapped around Maori education here is really fascinating, right? And some of it I thank you for. I guess, but the metaphors, right, the, the artwork, right, uh, you're going, oh, that's really interesting to move it inside a cultural uh, construct, um, whereas I don't think... I don't think we can argue that these pedagogies actually get that done, right? So I think that's really fascinating. Uh, uh, and I'll be taking that back with me, right? Try to figure that through, right? Like, well, what would that? You know, I think the hip hop pedagogy folks are, are got it. But there's a long way, for, well, first of all, whites aren't very good at hip hop, right? But secondly, you know, there's a long way to go to, uh, in that, because I think it, this, is, this kind of construct is brand new. And I don't think we've actually thought about that. 